And as we're going to continue our study, Life in the Spirit, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. Hello? All right, let's look at this. In Romans 8 and verse 8, it says, so then they that are in the flesh, now get that, in the flesh, cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. All right? Now, here we're going down deeper into this separation. And if you go back to, to part one and two, you'll begin to see that really what he's talking about is the law and grace. Right? It is the, the walk of the law, the life in the law, or the natural just natural, not talking about, you know, sinful, uh, good, evil, whatever it is, just natural, natural, right? And a whole lot, a great percentage of everything we do is natural, right? Amen. And then there's part that we might call supernatural, which is spirit. But we don't basically walk and live a whole lot in the spirit realm because we've learned uh, mostly from, from, from our, our whole existence to adhere to natural things. But what we've done is separated what? Good and evil. Good and evil. And a mature Christian is one that has really left all the evil and all they do is good. Right? And we showed that that's still the same tree. Right. All Christians do is move from one side of the tree to the other and they think they're doing great. And it doesn't dawn on them that they're still in the wrong tree. Right. In the midst of the Garden of Eden uh, was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Right. God said what? Freely eat of any tree, even the ones in the midst of the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat that. You know, why? Because it was something that was that was so good that he didn't want them to have it. No, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the very thing that would separate them from the tree of life. Right now, if you follow the tree of life through the scriptures, you'll find out that's Jesus. Right. And Jesus is what? He's grace righteousness, peace, joy, long-suffering. He's everything in the spirit that is good, right? <clears throat> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is everything that is, what? Opposite. Tree of life over here, opposite from the tree of life was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Opposite is called what? Antichrist, See, we get all caught up about the Antichrist. Well, the Antichrist, man, he's got to be some wicked, vile. You know, no, he could be, he could be um, the neighbor that you really like. Right? Amen. If you look at what it is, okay, you have Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the fullness of God himself. Right? So anything that is different from Christ, the, the word was made flesh, right? So the word, the truth of the word, not the law, but the truth of the word, which is the New Testament, the new covenant, which is basically found in the epistles, right? This is what was made flesh and become Jesus, the Christ who dwelt among us, right? Suffered and died, uh, went to hell in our place, exchanged lives with us, you know, was raised from the dead, amen? And um, uh, now uh, is seated at the right hand of God on the throne of righteousness. Okay. So we can basically say this and make this comment that what you find in the epistles is life. Okay. And it's, it's comes from the tree of life. 
which is Jesus. Okay? So anything against it or opposite from it now has become Antichrist. Christ is the anointed one, his anointing. Right? Anything that is different than the anointing is anti. Right? And so God showed us there in the garden that the, the greatest anti-Christ influence that you will ever be introduced to is the natural. Come on now. Let it soak in. Let it soak in. Which what? Which attracts our subconscious. Because we have uh, a, a drawing toward natural things that was given to us by natural birth. Okay? So our heart's already been imprinted with just natural things. Now, what we do is we try to go in there and we try to separate the good and the bad. And I'm a good Christian because I don't do those bad things anymore. And the less that I do bad things, right, then the more mature and Christ-like I am, right? And you're not Christ-like at all, right? All you're doing is abstaining from things you know that you shouldn't be doing, right? Christ is what? Christ is the spirit, the spirit life, the spirit walk. Okay, Christ is what? The anointing. What is anointing? Anointing is what separates from the natural into the spiritual, and it becomes the power. It emanates from the cross because the blood of Christ sanctified that cross, and the cross became uh, significant to us because it's now our death meaning we no longer live because of the cross, right? But Christ lives within us. So if Christ lives within us, then it's the power of the cross that is alive within us. We're going to get into some of this, right? And it's what? It's displayed by power. Say power. Power. Okay? What did, what did Paul say? He made this statement. He says, I preach nothing but the power of the cross, okay? Now, you can take that and say the power of the cross. That's the power to make us new creations in Christ, you know? And, and in a sense, it is, but there's so much more to it. The power of the cross is the power to walk away from your natural life, no matter how moral or how good it is. It isn't power. It isn't spiritual power. Listen, if you get into trouble in the natural, as a good Christian, right, we begin to pray and we reach out because we want what? We want the power of the Spirit. We want the power of the cross. We want the power of God and His love and Christ who fulfilled all things, right? So we're still separated we still think we are nothing more than natural beings that are born again, but everything is going to come from the Spirit. And if you can get God's attention, right, then He might answer your prayer. Hello? And not realize, and we went through it, I, I think, in part two, to realize that Jesus exchanged lives with us. He became our sin. That we became His righteousness. And what we got to do is learn how to flip our thinking and realize I'm not really on this natural earth trying to do good, but I'm actually seated in Christ in heavenly places. All right. Now, that's the viewpoint of the father. Yes, we're here. You can see us. We can touch each other. Right. But the father says, as far as I'm concerned, you're right there at my right hand in my son, Jesus Christ, right? And it says what? It says from that point, in a vantage point, is where we rule and reign, what, what, wait for it, in Christ, right? So I don't have the power, not anything of myself, right? But I'm in Christ. In Christ, I live and move and have my being. In Christ, I'm more than a conqueror. In Christ, I can do all things, right? 
when I begin to flip my brain and renew it and realize I'm living my life from above, right? And the earth is my footstool in, in, in that sense, right? So that I now become the director of my life. I can determine what I let into my life and what I don't want in, right? And if I don't want sickness in, it can't come in. The only way it can slip in is through my ignorance or through my doubt, right? And that's the reason a lot of times we'll get sick, we'll have pain or something like that, and it seems like we can't get it out, we can't uh, receive that healing, it's because there's doubt there. So what we end up doing is going back into that old mindset of just looking to God and pleading and wanting Him to do something, right, when He already did everything. It's in Christ. It's done. It's done. So the mind says, well, I don't get it. I don't know. It's confusing. That's not how I was taught. That was, okay, from the shoulders up. You are a mess. Right? I don't care how much you know. You know? And the only thing you'll end up doing is patting yourself on the back, and it'll wear your shoulders out. Right? It says what? Anything I am, I owe to the grace of God. Yes. I owe to the love of God who loved me. Right? I have no boast. You know what Paul said? I have no boast. I boast in the grace of God. You know, he made a couple of statements. He says, I labored more than all of you. But it wasn't really me. It was the grace of God. Right? Meaning he did have a part by yielding to it, by praying in tongues, by meditating in the word, by uh, letting the love of God rule and reign in his heart, right? Though he had to participate jointly with the love of God. Amen? See, it isn't, see, most Christians are just, they think that if they just lead a, a really nice, humble, moral life, then, um, then, then God might bless them. Right? And, and I could never understand why the majority of, uh, of Christians, when I meet them, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd say something, you know, and, and eventually come out, you know, pray for me that I make it. I may make it where? Make it to heaven. I said, aren't you born again? Well, yeah, but we never really know. I said, why? If you read your Bible, you'll really know. Yes. You know? See, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a smart at anything, but when, when you go into the Bible and you read the Bible in context for the truth that it unveils to you, right? And then you listen to most Christians, they're not the same thing, Right? Nobody knows. Right? There's, there's none righteous. No, not one. Well, yeah, that was before Jesus suffered and died and was raised from the dead. Right? But then we become the righteousness of God. Who made us righteous? God did. Nothing we did. All right. So can you see that basically what we're studying here and what Romans is talking about is the difference between the law, which the natural man served and was enslaved to. And then death is what frees you from law. You're no longer a slave because you're dead. Right. And then life is the life of the spirit or the finished work of Christ or the grace of God. So basically, Romans, which is an awesome, awesome book, you know, Romans is, is just, he, he tells you different ways all the way through it. There's parts of it that can be a little hard to understand, but especially chapter 7. But when you begin to understand, what he's talking about is law versus grace. Law versus grace. Man's work, God's work. What you have to do to earn and get something, what Jesus already did and gave it to you, Right? And he continues to go over this from different angles, right? <clears throat> All right, so let's go in this. Look, let's look at this. So then they that are in the flesh. So if we're talking about the difference between the law, which is governed by the natural, <clears throat> right, that, that brings death, and the spirit, which is grace and life. Okay, are you seeing that? So then what side would flesh be on? 
the natural law side or the spirit grace side. It'd be on the natural side, okay? And, and once you see this, okay, then the scriptures start illuminating, okay? Watch this. So then they that are in the flesh, what are they in? They're in the natural, right? And, and <clears throat> they're, they're in the law, and they make a law unto themselves. See, I heard people say, well, I'm not a Jew. That's only for the Jews. No, no, that is true, but only a partial truth. It goes on to say that even the Gentiles, anybody that is human, has already made laws unto themselves. And so they fall into the same detriment. It may not be the law that God set down, you know, through Moses, but it's the law that you've made unto yourself. And any law you make unto yourself, you're going to break it. Because there isn't anybody that has ever lived other than Jesus, the Christ, right? That, <clears throat> that ever fulfilled everything and never broke any laws. Now, here's the point. Here's the point. <clears throat> If you break even the smallest of the law, right? The Bible says you broke the whole law. So it isn't who can be the most moral. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, well, oops, I said that. Uh, I didn't mean that. It was, yeah, you lied. Oh, but it was, it, it didn't hurt anybody. It was a little bitty one. It was just a little white one, <laughs> you know. No, it, it doesn't matter. There's no, no big, no, there's no little, right? Okay, so if, if you break the tiniest of the law, the whole thing shattered, right? That means if I end up telling a lie, a little lie doesn't mean a big deal, okay? Now, I'm guilty of adultery, fornication, murder, I mean, everything that was in there, I'm now guilty for it. Why? Because I broke the whole thing. Come on. Now, there's scripture for that. But if I live <clears throat> by the faith of the Son of God, if I live in the Spirit, right, then the mercy of God knows I'm not perfect. I can't keep it, right? So what, what do I? I apply the blood of Jesus to my life, okay? And, and I, by faith, and I have to consciously know what I'm doing, right? By faith, I say, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I've given myself to Christ, meaning what? That now I'm accredited to the life that Jesus lived. <laughs> right? Why? Because he exchanged lives. Okay? Now, naturally speaking, I'm still messed up. I still do things that I shouldn't and, 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 and don't do things that I should. Right? Chapter 7. Why do I keep doing the things that I shouldn't be doing? How come I'm not doing the things that I should be doing? Oh, wicked man that I am. Right? He says what? He says, I try to be good. I try to fulfill everything, you know, that, that, that the, the law prescribed or that the, uh, the Christ prescribed. He says, but I can't do it. I, I keep coming up short. It's impossible. Right? So then he says, oh, now I see. Even though with my flesh, right? Flesh is what? The natural. the natural. Even though my flesh, see, serves the sin or the rudiments of this natural life, he says, my heart and my mind will serve Christ, right? Meaning what? I would rather tap in to the grace of God that effortlessly changes me from the inside out instead of yielding myself to my abilities to abstain from everything that they call sin. See? Or yield it to my conscience. Right? Let your conscience be your guide. It will lead you straight to hell. <laughs> right? <laughs> Listen, the life that we now live, got to get this, the life that we now live, we live by the faith 
of the son. Whose faith? Did you get it? Did you get it? All right. So he even took any work that you could do. He took it away from you. He didn't say, now I live by the good works that I can do. Now I live by. No, he says, you live now by his faith. Jesus said, you're going to live by my faith. Not yours. Mine. Mine. And so we've all been given a gift of faith or a measure of faith whereby we believe in the grace of God and that enables us to open ourselves up to yield ourselves and let God do all the work. But there probably isn't a denomination on the face of the earth that really believes that, right? Why? Because we always go to the natural, what we can naturally do, right? And if you do something you shouldn't, you messed up. I mean, God might throw you on the junk, junk heap, just, you know, teach you a lesson or whatever. Right? Why? Because we are so, so naturally influenced by natural laws and natural thinking and natural people, even though they may be born again, they're still ruled by natural laws. Oh, you just think that, that you could just go out there and, and, and drink, get drunk and carouse and, and commit adultery and fornication and all that and then, and then just show up at church, you know, with a happy smile. Christians do it all the time. Right? As a matter of fact, every one of them. Oh, you say, oh, no, I've never done that. I've never even drank. Wait a minute. Did you not forget if you break one little thing, you broke it all? Okay. Can anybody really testify and say, I have never told a lie, not even a tiny little one? You know? No. We all do. A lot of times unknowingly. Right? You go into the store and you have a little one. And you, Mommy, can I have one of those? No, we don't have money. Liar. Huh? Come on. Yeah, it can be simple things. And so if you're going to yield yourself into that, think how hard it would be to live a life totally sinless of any of that stuff that we don't even, we don't even think is sin. Right? Why? Because religion has still kept us in the wrong tree, only trying to get and move people from the bad side of the tree to the good side of the tree. Right? And on the good side... It's this one. It'd be the right side, right? The good side of the tree, the right side of the tree is where all the awesome people are, and that's where Christians hang out, and that's where you need to be, right? And so if we see you slipping over to that other side, we just say you're a backslider, and we need to go get you and bring you back to the right side of the tree. See? And after generation, after generation, after generation, after generation... It's never really dawned on Christians that they're still in the wrong tree. Right. You need to get out. Yeah. Think what it would be in a heavy wind and, and you got an aluminum ladder and it's blowing all over the place and you finally get it up to this building and you start climbing up it and it's tedious and you get to, get to the top and you think, I made it! And you look and it's leaning against the wrong building. Yeah. <laughs> right? See, that's what's happening. So what do we do? Well, all the people on the right side of the tree get together and say, no, we don't believe any of that. We don't believe that there's another tree we can go to. That's only by the, the, the special powers of God and if he likes us and everything else. So we determine that this is right. See, and in, 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 uh, in, in Romans, see, Paul says, if the whole world came to an agreement against God, God would still be right. <laughs> right? So have you figured out yet that the kingdom of God is not a democracy? Huh? It's not. You can all get together. See, all the Baptists can get together and, and vote, and there's more Baptists than there are people. So, <laughs> no, just kidding. <clears throat> but they can all vote and say, we're the only true way. Okay, 
Well, yeah, hey, look it. You got more people in your denomination than anybody else, so I guess, you know, that says something. It doesn't say anything. See, God is right. The Word is right. Christ is right. Right? So he says what? Rightly divide the truth. You know? And, and look at it. Meditate in it. Keep it in context. See what it's saying. Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's get a little bit deeper. <clears throat> Verse 11. Romans eight eleven says, But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, because of this, right? So what he said so far is just setting you up for what he's about to say, right? He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Or he could say, we're not in debt to the flesh. What is the flesh? The natural. The natural life. Don't separate into good and bad and whatever. It's just natural life. Human existence on planet Earth. Right? No matter who you are, no matter what gender, no matter what race, color, creed, whatever it is, it's all natural. Right? So the division now is what? Natural, spiritual. Natural, spiritual. This is where Paul is beginning to bring all things together and tell them, now, we have no debt to this natural world. None at all. No debt. What is a debtor? A what? Yeah, he owes, right? But a debtor is what? He's enslaved by his debt. Right. So when it's saying that that we are not a debtor to the flesh, he's saying that we are not enslaved to the natural world. Good, bad, indifferent. Like I said, no matter what it is. See, as Christians, we love to get in there and separate it all out. <clears throat> right. Well, there's some churches. That believe if you smoke a cigarette, you go straight to hell on a grease pole and not stop it. At, at go <laughs> right just there you are you're gone then there's other churches that have an intermission halfway through the service and everyone goes out for a smoke break yeah. come on they, they exist <laughs> okay there's some churches that say if you drink alcohol in any way shape or form God will probably throw you on the trash heap You'll never answer a prayer. You'll probably go to hell on a grease pole. Right? Then there's other churches that roll out the barrel. The big keg. And they, and they have a, a, a hoedown. And, and, and it's, it, there's nothing wrong with drinking. Beer. If you drink whiskey, you go to hell. Come on now. What do we do? We make up our own rules and all of it we say we got from scripture but how many of you know the scripture can't teach multiple different things from the same scripture right hallelujah anyway I, I got some other examples but I won't go into them it would totally shock you <clears throat> but we're talking about <clears throat> churches in America all right, <laughs> now look at this. He said, we are not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. The flesh is what? The natural. So we're not in debt to the natural to live after the natural. But if you cut out the natural out of your life, what are you going to have left? Mm -hmm. But us personally. We wouldn't know what to do. We just sit there with a thumb in our mouth, shaking, going, God, God, what do I do? You know, because we're still heavily, heavily 
influenced by natural things. Natural things, right? See, if, if we've given ourselves to the spiritual, to the truth and the reality of Christ and who we are in him, what he's provided for us, what he's freely given us, see, we would want or lack for nothing. Nothing. We wouldn't be indebted to anyone for anything. Come on. We wouldn't really care what anyone thought about us. It would be impossible to embarrass us. We would never be angry or upset. We would never have cold shoulders. Right? What's wrong, honey? Nothing. Yeah, we know that's a lie. Come on now. But what are we saying? We're saying that there's a place... Right? In Christ, that God Himself provided for us to live and dwell. Right? Do we know how? No. If we did, we'd be there. Right? So the greatest pull, the greatest influence in our lives is still the natural, but it's the good natural. Right. But see, the good natural is going to separate you. Come on. Separate you from the fullness of what God already gave you. Because before long, you're going to go back into trying to earn something. Right. Come on. Well, let's keep going. So in the flesh is controlled by natural things. And we live mostly by the influence of just a natural world, a normal natural world. It says not to be in debt to the flesh is to not be enslaved by the natural life. Right? There's a lot of things that we think, well, that's just life. Right? Come on. Haven't you ever said that? Well, that's just life. Yeah, well. We're getting older, you know. Come on. Come on. Well, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Come on. Oh, look at those Richies. Yeah, wish I had your car and you had my used tanky. <laughs> you know, see, there's natural things that, that we just go out and we look at, see, and, and, and the whole time, we're excluding on a subconscious level. We're, uh, we're nullifying, excluding what Christ has already done and what Christ has already given. Right? And so, can I say this? Basically, we still don't know or understand the fullness of what has already been given. Right? But... The Holy Spirit was given to us. Why was he sent? To lead and guide us into the righteousness that God provided for us at Christ's expense. Right? And so the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And, and, and if we would just start listening to him, if we would develop an ear to hear what he's saying, right? And if we would quit reasoning with ourselves. Sounds like a scripture there somewhere. Do not reason among yourselves, but come reason with me, saith God. Right? If we would not reason among ourselves and with ourselves, but just reason with God, see, we'd find a life of freedom because he's not looking for someone to be perfect and not ever make a mistake. He just wants someone that will open up and love him and let him love them and let the Holy Spirit just effortlessly begin to change us, which is called what? Transformation, right? So the main thing is we need to search the scriptures. We need to pray in the spirit. We need to meditate in the word of God. We need to uh, walk in the love of God. We need to worship God with a rendered heart and, and, and a true thanksgiving for all that Christ did for us. And we need to accept 
the free gift, right? And know that, that, that it's already a done deal with us. We just need to follow the Holy Spirit and he'll begin to show and reveal to us things that we need to do to what? Either wipe away the ignorance uh, of not knowing or to remove the doubt that is hindering, right? And he'll do them both. The Holy Spirit will, right? And so we need to yield ourselves. But it isn't a prayer that you make once in a lifetime. It's something you become conscious to, right? Conscious to. It's like I was, I was eating lunch with this was one uh, evangelist, and uh, he just started eating, and I was going to pray. And, and he says, oh, do you pray over your meals? I said, well, yeah, I give thanks. I'm, I'm thankful. And he says, you know, I figured God knows I'm thankful. And I said, well, it doesn't hurt to tell him. I said, I'm sure your wife knows that you love her, but it doesn't hurt to tell her. He goes, okay, thank you, Father. <laughs> you know, so I'm saying develop a life of gratitude, a life of thanksgiving. A life of being overwhelmed emotionally and physically of the goodness of God and how awesome he is. And that he chose us and that he doesn't expect us to get in, you know, in, into one of those little wheels like that rat and just <laughs> run. He, he's not looking for us to perform, you know. And, and you hear so many uh, Sermons, you know, they sound good. Why? Because we have a natural bend, right? That's the reason a lot of sermons just sound really good. You know, I've had people come and say, who has listened to so-and-so? And they were teaching on the grace of God. And I said, what did they say? They said this. And I said, that's not even grace. It's not? N no. See, most people mix grace and mercy up, you know, but for the grace of God. You know, there go I. All right. That can be on either way. It can either be what it's saying is, is except for uh, the ability of God that is overtaking me. Right. I would go that way. Right. Or it could be except for the mercy of God. I'd still be going that way. So mercy is powerful. Grace is powerful. But they're not the same thing. Otherwise, you can interchange the words in the scriptures, and you can't. You can't, right? And I don't mean to, like, like dice up God. <clears throat> you know, you can't dice up God. You can't. Uh, uh, I remember somebody told me, uh, they says, well, um, grace is not a subject, it's a person. And I said, well, everything is a person. Righteousness, peace, joy. You name anything. In the New Testament, and it's a person. It's Christ, right. not just grace. I mean, that, that's a partial illumination, but you got to understand when you pick up your Bible, you're picking up Christ and you're reading Christ, right? The living Word of God. And so you need to be infatuated with it. You need to love it. See, people, if, if you took Christians, you just say, say, just close your eyes. Oh, just think about it. Wouldn't it would be awesome? To just go up and sit by Jesus, sit at his feet and look up at him, you know, and stuff. And, and people would go, yeah, oh, God, Jesus, oh, Jesus. You know, but then their Bible's sitting over there, been sitting over there all week on the coffee table. Mm. Because they haven't seen the connection. When you see that connection, oh, one of your most enjoyable things in life will be reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God. I love the Word of God. Amen? And you know what? It never lets you down and it never fails you. I can open up the scriptures that I've read 10,000 times in 45 years and I'll read it and something else will just come out and I'll go, whoa. You know? But you develop it. Paul said, train yourself. Teach yourself. Okay, here's a good one. Study to be quiet. You know, it takes study. 
<laughs> right? Now, now look at this. Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now get this part. Don't just slide right through it. All right? Slow it down. Slow it down. Now, watch this. Galatians 5.16. This I say. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh see most christians lives is trying to do away with the lust of the flesh and never get into walking in the spirit because they think being spiritual is getting rid of all the flesh but he's saying it's just the opposite Right? Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit of God. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You don't even have to fight the flesh. You don't have to abstain from it. You don't even have to, uh, to worry or even think about it. If you develop a life where you're walking in the Spirit. Right? Come on. Isn't that awesome? You say, well, how can you do that? The Holy Spirit. We just said it. And it's His grace, not your effort. All right. So what? It just effortlessly changes. And you come to a place where your whole desire is for spiritual things. And the more your mind and attention and influences in spiritual things, the less they'll be on natural things. Come on. All right. This I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth, that just means high pressure, right? For the flesh, the natural, the natural, say natural. The natural has high pressure against the spirit. And the spirit has high pressure against the flesh. And these are contrary. Now, we said those two trees are what? We're contrary. Okay. In our natural life, we make room for contrary things because we've determined that they're not bad. Now, does it mean you can't go to a ball game? Does it mean, no, no, I'm not saying any of that. The whole thing, what Paul is down here, is what has grabbed hold of your attention? What is it hard to get away from? You ever have someone do you wrong real bad? Okay, can you just drop it and walk away? See, sometimes you hang on things for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Right? I prayed for a lady in him at one time. Uh, I prayed for her once and she was healed of cancer. She had like two weeks to live and she was healed of cancer and she was so excited. <clears throat> right? And I never did see her again. Um, and until she, she came to one of my Bible studies, and I saw her in the back there, and I thought, wow, praise God. It took a while, but she, she came to one of our studies. And I said, so good to see you, you know. And, and she stood up, and her, her, she had a slight stroke, and her hand was, was paralyzed in that position. She couldn't move it. And she was a painter, right? And she stood like that. And, and this is so cool. This is God, Right? And the Holy Spirit came up on me. I said, stretch forth your hand. And she went, <laughs> and it just became normal, just like that. I went, whoa. <laughs> you know, it was like I was standing there watching that going, wow, that was awesome. <laughs> right? So it didn't come from me. <clears throat> right? Then didn't see her again for years. And then I got a call, you know, would I come to her house and, and she wanted to talk to me. And I thought, praise God, okay, this time, God, you know. So I went over there, and, and uh, she was laid up, and, and, and they, they said, told her to have Christmas early with her family and stuff because she wouldn't be alive by Christmas, right? And so I started talking with her, you know, and I was, you know, I had my healing scriptures, 
Come on, why? Because we were taught, and that's what we were influenced, that if, if you have sickness or something, you go to healing scriptures. Well, that seems smart, right? But it says he sent his word to heal. And his word contains more than healing scriptures, right? So every word has the power of change, right? So I sat down and, and, and the Lord told me to talk to her about forgiveness. And I think, she's on her deathbed and I'm going to talk to her about forgiveness? This is in my mind. And so I started talking to her about forgiveness and, you know, and showing her some scriptures about the love of God and, and everything, you know. And she started crying. I thought, uh-oh. And she looked at me and she says, you mean, I go, oh, Jesus, do you mean that if I don't forgive someone, then that makes me as bad or worse than them? And, of course, I opened my mouth and and I, and I was going to say, well, not exactly. And when I opened my mouth, I said, yes, exactly. And I thought. <laughs> and she, because she started crying, she was just really crying heavy. And going, oh, Jesus. <laughs> this, is, this is in the, in, in the, in the background. You're going, <laughs> come on, wisdom, don't let me down. <clears throat> you know. And then she looked at me and she said, whoa, I'm ready to go to heaven. I said, you are? <laughs> she said, yeah. I said, no, let, let's pray, you know, to be healed. She said, don't care. Don't care. She says, right then when you said that, something that I've held for over 38 years against somebody, somebody in her family abused her when she was little, hated that person. You know, she could say their name and spit and the grass would die. Hated that person, but she let go. And she says, I've never known this peace. I would gladly go to heaven today. And anyway, I <clears throat> hugged her and shook her hand and stuff. And I says, I'll, I'll, I'll check up on you. And I left and she got up out of bed Sat down, had dinner. Next day went to the doctor. They couldn't find a trace of cancer or anything else in her. Is that awesome? See, that doesn't fit in most people's theology. Not even those that have a real good theology. <laughs> right? See, it's hard to figure out life without trying to put it in steps, right? And principles and things. And what did he say? Just walk in the Spirit. What? If Christ is in you, you're in the Spirit. Okay? So what do we do? We've been taught to call those things that be not as though they are. But on this, it would be hard to do that, right? But that's what God says. So what do I say? I walk in the Spirit. 24-7, I'm in the Spirit. I'm in the Spirit. I walk in the Spirit. I live in the Spirit. I'm in the Spirit. I'm not of the things of this world, not of the natural things. They don't have my mind. They don't have, they're not influencing me. It's the spiritual things that influence me. Gladly I give my mind, my soul, my body, everything to the things of God, to the Spirit of God. Praise God. I love walking in the Spirit. I love walking in the Spirit. See, then someone will say something and you'll get upset, slam the door, shout, you know, cry, run, hide under the bed for a while, and, and, and the devil will say, yeah, sure, you walk in the Spirit. And that's where the boldness comes out. Yes, I do. See, none of this has anything to do with who I am. I am not a bunch of actions, whether they be right or wrong. I am a new creation in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And it really has nothing to do with my actions since I'm illuminated that I'm in the Spirit, right? Now, just very quickly, very quickly, and we'll maybe go back over this uh, next week if we keep going, right? 
he, sa- he says, um, verse 18, he says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works, get this, get this, get this, the what? The, works. the what? The works. Now, did it, it didn't say sin, did it? It said what? The works. The works. 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 Now the works of the flesh. Flesh is what? The natural. Because you've given yourself to the influence of the natural life and world and everything else, it's going to begin to manifest itself in what? In adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And it goes on and it lists all the things that you uh, wish you'd never done any of them and hope you, you never do any of them ever again. <laughs> so oh, there's some bad stuff, <clears throat> right? So it goes through all of that. Where I, I, I don't want to you know, get into that. <clears throat> okay, get it? Get into that. Okay, so the force of the natural life pressures the spiritual life, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not man's conscience to keep us on the right path. It was the tree of life's enemy. Okay, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, see, had conflict. It was opposite. It was enemy of the tree of life. Adam went to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it enlightened and brought forth his own consciousness, right? So that he could conclude and determine what is right and wrong for him, right? And it wasn't so that he can do, you know, evil, wicked stuff. I mean, he couldn't commit adultery. There's only one woman on earth. Right? There were no bars, no banks to rob. There wasn't anything to do that was wrong. Okay? So even though he may have had good intentions, in a sense, it was wrong because it shut him off from the divine spirit, godly conscience, God's conscience. Right? So now he started living by his conscience. And he started living by right and wrong. All right? How many of you know that the prisons are full of people that didn't think it was wrong to do what they did? What's wrong is these policemen. What do you think is flooded with defund the police and, and all this stuff? All the people that are pushing that stuff, see, they want to, to, uh, to g- get into their own lust and not be counted guilty for it, yeah. right? That's why they try to legislate laws and all this stuff that, that opens it up with, with, with uh, genderism and racism and, and all the things that are going on, okay? The one thing you can't legislate is honesty, purity, righteousness, right? And this is what? This is the life of the Spirit. The only way it, it, you, know, you can activate it in your life is to give yourself to it, right? But now what happens, you got you to gotta be influenced. Give it your influence. Did you get it? So if you're trying to stop doing all this, then what has your influence? Everything you're trying to quit. That's why I said, if you just do and yield yourself to the Spirit, all the other stuff will just vanish. Come on. Did you get something out of that? Praise God. Amen.